Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So um, again, uh, along COVID lines, uh, the sheriff's office is facing the really difficult task of balancing public safety and keeping our jail facility healthy. Um, you can imagine there'd be nothing worse than a COVID outbreak in a closed facility where double bunking and um, crowding are the standard. Um, so we, we worked with the health department, our health service administrator, our contract doctor, our county attorney, and developed um, some pretty restrictive arrest standards around who we will accept in the jail during this COVID uh, pandemic and who we won't. And it's obviously um, created conflict concerns among some people in the public and among some of the police chiefs around, uh, you know, dealing with behaviors in the community. But the goal here is to keep the jail operating and have space for people who absolutely need to be in the jail, people who are committing victim rights crimes, people in the, that are committing very serious crimes like homicide, sex assault, stalking, domestic violence, the kind of cases where we're required to make custodial arrests. Uh, we need to have a jail available for them. Uh, we are, we're not taking uh, nonviolent misdemeanors, or petty offenses. We're not taking municipal offenses. We're not taking traffic cases, uh, warrants on uh, failure to appear on those minor cases. And so justice is being delayed for a lot of people. Uh, there are people in our community that have multiple warrants uh, for minor offenses that are not being accepted in our jail right now, which is obviously frustrating our police departments and some of our community members. But um, again, the worst thing that can happen is that we have to shut the jail down entirely or move people or, uh, you know, <laughs> an example would be uh, We've had deputies test positive and um, at doing contract tracing, we've had to send seven or eight of their coworkers home for a period of time for testing and observation. You can imagine if we had to do that three or four times over the effect on staffing and our ability to staff the jail would be impacted uh, badly. Um, our jail has 560 bed capacity and was operating around 480 to 500 beds um, before COVID. We have those numbers down to under 300 right now. Uh, today, around 280 some. The, um, the, the advantage to that is we're able to isolate people when they come in. We're able to do um, health screening and we're able to keep people separate and in cohorts until we know they're healthy. And then they can be moved into a general population. And then we can keep the general population safe. We've had several uh, small outbreaks, two inmates at a time. Um, and we've been able to keep the jail from becoming sick because we've had the space to keep those folks isolated and out of contact with the general population at the back of the jail. I, I don't see the situation changing until there is uh, effective treatment or vaccine. I don't know what the alternatives are right now for this. And I will also tell you, this isn't a Boulder County uh, phenomenon. This is happening across the state of Colorado and across the United States. Um, this is a, an issue that's nationwide right now. So that's the background. Um, Great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you might be done. So, yeah. So that's the background. I just I'm here to answer questions or um, field field complaints or <laughs> concerns. <laughs> Very good. So, Council, this is your opportunity to ask Sheriff Pelly questions. Um, I don't see any hands up. So, um, Rachel. Yep. Um, thanks for being here, Sheriff. Sure. Um, a couple 
questions. So first, like using your example of stalking as something that is eligible to be jailed right now, that's a crime that in the 1980s and prior to that was seen as pretty low level and uh, non-threatening. And it turned out to be highly predictive of violent crimes. So I'm wondering, are we looking at um, other crimes that are predictive of violence, even if the crime itself is not as eligible to be jailed? And are we also looking at like full criminal histories that's you, know, you often look at that when you're determining um, if somebody's a good candidate for bail as an example. So just wondering if if that enters the picture, either of those two like old sure. criminal and um, sort of predictive crimes. So Colorado has a broad ranging victim rights amendment to our constitution, uh, wherein lawmakers uh, have looked at um, violence that is predictably harmful and have made those uh, BRA crimes subject to the, the, uh, the amendment. And that requires a number of things. It includes arrest, notification of each phase of the legal process, uh, you know, special victim rights, and any and all of those BRA crimes, victim rights amendment crimes are uh, uh, subject to jail and we, we are accepting them. And thank you. And I mean that even more broadly, like are there other crimes that, that are, um, you know, maybe outside of that, that are predictive of violence that, you know, are not in themselves violent crimes. And maybe you're saying that that act captures all of them and I'm not familiar enough with it. Um, so yeah, that's there- That's being looked at. Yes and no, there can be, uh, there are a number of issues concerning bad behavior minor assault, um, threats, that kind of thing that uh, that all arise to VRA if they become a misdemeanor crime and we are accepting them. Um, we're not doing an analysis of a, def a defendant or someone we contact on the street in order to determine or try to predict um, their volatility in the future. And, and are you looking at, at full criminal histories when you make the determination whether to, to I guess, accept somebody for jail for, a, for an offense? No, we're not. We are uh, accepting people who are committing new offenses and have a, uh, a three or more outstanding warrants. Um, we are accepting uh, people who have been charged with, again, victim rights crimes based on the crime they committed at the time. Okay, um, that's helpful. I think, um, Sam, I have some other questions, but they're not really for the sheriff. They're sort of like crime data questions. So are, will there be time at the end of these for us to talk about like things we may wanna consider as a council on, on uh, I guess, criminal justice issues and COVID? I don't know that we have anything that's specifically on the agenda. What I might suggest, and Rachel, you, you talked with me about this before, um, as we have the conversation with um, Chief Harold about the um, oversight, maybe at the end of that, we could ask her for some feedback on this subject, um, or we could ask her now if you prefer, okay. but it is probably a long, okay. So so I'd suggest that we, we... go ahead, I'm sorry. No, just the, the other part of it was sort of COVID enforcement as a city specific. So if that's better to talk with it, as we do police oversight, I'm happy to bring it up there too. It's not really related to this. Uh, I, it's, a will, it's a will of counsel. Um, I don't, don't know that we had set aside time at CAC for that kind of conversation here. But if the will of counsel would be to have that conversation right now, we can certainly do it. Um, but let's go ahead and get through um, the conversation with Sheriff Pelly first. Um, Bob, you have questions? Yeah, just one question. Uh, Cheryl, thank you so much for being here uh, with us this evening. And, and you're always welcome to come back and visit with us if you've got new things to report, of course. Um, it sounds like the primary issue is a spacing issue. And I think we all understand why you're trying to distance um, the inmates or the prisoners um, from each other so that there's less likely to spread to each other and to your, um, your team. Have you heard about any other um, either counties in Colorado or maybe even jails in other parts of the country that have created additional space outside of their traditional jail where they've taken other buildings 
and created that spacing so that they could um, uh, jail the people that are typically jailed without exposing either um, the inmates or um, the, um, the county staff to COVID, uh, taking extra buildings, extra space. Uh, obviously it's not the time of year for tenting, but if there was an extra building available to you that was appropriately secure, have you heard of counties around the country doing anything like that? I have not. And I think part of the issue is staffing. Uh, whenever you take a building that's not designed to be a jail and put every level of security, uh, say on an intake side in that building, the uh, staffing requirements become intensive, very, very intensive. Uh, you know, right now, uh, two of my staff can take care of about 64 inmates. Um, with rovers and some additional support, but um, you go to any kind of converted warehouse space or that kind of thing, the only people you would be able to put in that facility would be low risk minor offenders. Those are the people we're not accepting into our jail right now. So the people we have in our jail right now are high need, high security risk, uh, more violent offenders, um, more risk to the community, and they require a jail setting. Okay, I'm just trying to strike a balance here because we, we do hear from our police department and, and the chief can jump in if she wants. So we hear from our police department that they are frustrated and we have members of the community who are frustrated because people who the police normally would arrest and bring to the jail are not being brought to the jail. And so, um, while I understand that you're accepting only the most violent or serious offenders, we are turning away from the jail or not arresting in the first place people that normally would be arrested. And so I'm just looking for a solution there so yeah. the police can do their jobs and arrest people that they would normally arrest and put them in secure facilities. And if, it, if it's a staffing and funding issue, that'd be helpful to know. Yeah. It's, and it's more than just staffing and funding with, with bond reform and the legislation that we've seen in the last couple of years in Colorado, um, people that are being arrested and brought to the jail on minor offenses are spending an average of about 12 and a half hours there and then being released back into the community on a personal recognizance bond uh, after they meet with the bond commissioner or appear in court at the jail. And so um, we're not taking people off the street for any length of time. In fact, we're essentially a revolving door at this point for those low, low level offenders. And so the, you know, the question is uh, at what risk do we operate a revolving door and expose the facility to people from the outside. And I understand what you're getting at, but I'm just trying to point out that this is complicated by the fact that um, people who are being arrested for uh, petty, you know, petty theft or trespassing or, or, or uh, camping violations or those kind of things, they're not spending any time in jail and they won't in the future. Okay, well, thanks, Sheriff. Maybe this is a discussion that um, goes down the path that, uh, that Rachel suggested, and I would like to have that discussion as well, whether that's tonight or at a time that we can schedule, Sam. Thanks. Great. Okay, well, I see no other hands up for questions. Sheriff, thank you so much for being here. Um, I see Chief Harold. Chief, would you like to speak up? Yeah, the, the only thing that, uh, good evening, council members. Um, this is why I never wanted to be a sheriff. Um, running um running a jail is is very complicated and um you know I, I support the sheriff's decision making um i think it's very complex <clears throat> and i think that you know uh, a, a cluster in the jail to me would be devastating because i have called other jails um around colorado um asking for help um with some of our repeat offenders that are causing damage to our community. There's no doubt about it that our crime rates are, are going up, especially property crime. And I don't wanna see that neither as a sheriff. I think this is a perfect storm. It's not, it's not one dimensional. Um, and so uh, like the sheriff said, if, if there was a cluster in the jail, either by his staff or the inmates, um, he may have to close that facility, and then I would not have a place to hold violent offenders like domestic violence, like sexual assaults, like child abuse, um, and violent predators um, that we do have. And so um, I think that 
this needs to be an ongoing discussion, just like COVID, because there's multiple factors at play here. Um, and I'll be glad to have those conversations and kind of send you um, the data points that I'm looking at on a daily basis. And, you know, the sheriff has helped me out on situations where I need, I need people to be housed. Um, and so um, I know that he's just as frustrated as, as we are in the community, um, but it, it, is a, it is a complex situation. And I, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Would, um, there. Go ahead, Sheriff. I would like to point okay. out that we have we have made a number of changes to this based on input from the police departments. We are definitely jailing people who are committing uh, burglaries to businesses that have been closed. We are definitely we you know we had the complaint that uh, people knew they could not be arrested and we're essentially acting openly in defiance from lawful orders from police officers because of that. So we carved out an exception that we will accept. We will take people into jail when that occurs. So we're trying to be responsive as, as much as we can. And I wanted to um, make sure I made that point before we signed off. Very good, Sheriff. I really appreciate you being here tonight. It's very helpful that we can hear from you directly about the situation and ask our questions. Uh, we may ask you to come back again, uh, depending on how things develop going forward. So thanks again for being here. Much appreciated. Okay. Um, let me pull up the script here briefly.